is also where the entrenchment, and frankly, when Bruce Rauner, uh, who's a mutual friend of uh, Jim's and probably many of you in this room, who's been involved in education for many years, uh, asked after seeing that we passed legislation in several states, including Colorado, um, that we look at Illinois, I was, I was skeptical. Um, and after interviewing 55 uh, different folks in the landscape, Speaker of the House, Senate President, minority leadership, education advocates, um, met with Jim and many others, um, was very surprised to see that there was a, a tremendous political opening that I think Bruce wasn't even aware of. And that was that the Illinois Federation of Teachers, uh, still inexplicably, went to war with Speaker Madigan, who Jim cited as a very, very powerful uh, figure, who had been Speaker for 27 years, uh, with the exception of a couple of years between 94 and 96, over an incremental pension reform. Uh, and Jim and many others are diehard advocates for pension reform in Illinois, and, and the pension reform that happened in 2010 is not the reform that's needed in Illinois. But it was a first step, only affecting future employees. The union could well have, probably definitely should have, thanked Madigan for not going further. Instead, they um, decided that the $2 million they had been giving him reliably for um, election campaigns, um, that they would take that away, that they would uh, refuse to endorse any Democrat who voted for that legislation, even those that had been loyal supporters for years. And they went to the AFL-CIO and tried to get them to do the same. Um, so a major breach, um, and it's something just as you're kind of starting to think of ways in which the context in Illinois is similar to other states, you're starting to see that in other states, where Democrats are, who are still in control are having to address these terrible fiscal issues, and in so doing, there's often conflicts that are arising. So there's this breach, and um, uh, stand um, with the support of Jim, um, Brian Simmons, um, and a few others, uh, Ken Griffin. Uh, well, actually, initially, it was uh, Jim, Matt Hulsizer, Paul Finnegan, we decided to get involved in midterm elections, which many advised us against doing because we're new to town, we don't know the landscape. But my position was we had to be involved to show our capability to build some clout. So we very quickly researched the situation. And while there was a lot of folks, I think, um, who thought that the Republicans were going to take over um, in Illinois, uh, our analysis was that Madigan would still be speaker. And that was, you know, district by district, um, dispassionate. Um, that wasn't what I think a lot of our colleagues wanted to hear. This was in one of the one of the several spikes of Blagojevich indictment uh, headlines, and so no, seriously, as, as a political flow, you would have bet against people running uh, in his shadow. That's exactly right. Um, and there's obviously a red wave um, last cycle, and so our analysis was he was still going to be in power, and as such, the raw politics of it were that we should tilt toward him. And so we interviewed 36 candidates in targeted races. And essentially, I'm being quite blunt here, um, the individual candidates were essentially a vehicle to, to um, execute a political objective, which was to tilt toward Madigan. So the press never picked up on it. We endorsed nine individuals, um, and uh, six of them were Democrats, three Republicans, and tilted our money toward Madigan, who was expecting, because of Bruce Rauner's leadership, and uh, Bruce is a Republican, that all of our money was going to go to Republicans. Um, uh, that that was really a show of uh, an indication to him that we could be a new partner to take the place of the Illinois Federation of Teachers. That was the point. Um, luckily, it never got covered that way. Um, that wouldn't work well um, in Illinois. Madigan's not particularly well uh, liked. Um, and um, it did work. After the election, um, Advance Illinois and Stan had drafted a very bold proposal we called Performance Counts. It tied tenure and layoffs to performance. It let principals hire who they choose. It streamlined dismissal of ineffective tenured teachers substantially, from two plus years, 200,000 plus in legal fees on average, to three to four months, with very uh, little likelihood of legal recourse. And most importantly, uh, we called for the reform of collective bargaining throughout the state, essentially proposing that school boards would be able to decide any disputed issue at impasse. So a very, very bold proposal for Illinois, and one that six months earlier would have been unthinkable, undiscussable. Now, after the election, I went back to Madigan, and I confirmed, reviewed the proposal that we had already discussed, and I confirmed his support. He said he was supportive. The next day, he created an education reform committee, and his political director called to ask 
for our suggestions of who should be on it. And so in Aurora, Illinois, in December, out of nowhere, there are hearings on our proposal. In addition, we hired 11 lobbyists, including four of the absolute best insiders and seven of the best minority lobbyists, preventing the unions from hiring them. We enlisted a statewide public affairs firm. We had tens of thousands of supporters. And with Jim's and many others stepping up, Paula and Steve, thank you, we raised $3 million for our political action committee between the election and the end of the year. That's more money than either of the unions have in their political action committees. And so essentially what we did in a very short period of time was shift the balance of power. And I can tell you there was a palpable sense of concern, if not shock, on the part of the teachers' unions in Illinois that Speaker Madigan had changed um, allegiance and that we had clear political capability to potentially jam this proposal down their throats the same way pension reform had been jammed down their throats six months earlier. In fact, the pension reform was called Senate Bill 1946, and the unions took to talking to each other about, we're not going to let ourselves be 1946 again, using it as a verb. Uh, and so um, in the short, in what's called um, lame duck session in January, called lame duck session because some lame ducks are allowed to take a last vote for politically difficult um, uh, topics, proposals. We made an attempt to do just that, and we weren't able to move our proposal. Um, and my analysis to Jim and others was that it went a little too far for Illinois. Um, but as you'll see in just a second, it was an effective starting point because we started extremely, gave ourselves some room to come back. Senator Kimberly Lightford, who's been a reliable supporter of unions and in the middle of education um, policymaking, uh, intervened. She has a lot of clout in the Senate. She helped elect the Senate President, John Cullerton, and she forced groups to the table. The unions were thrilled to come to the table and to discuss things that, again, nine months earlier, they would not have been willing to discuss. And so over the course of three months, with Advanced Illinois taking the negotiating lead, my colleague Jessica Handy, our policy director in the room for every meeting, and, and Advanced and Stan working in lockstep, and that unity is so important, that partnership, caucusing before every meeting, caucusing after every meeting, making plans, um, they essentially gave away every single provision uh, related to teacher effectiveness that we had proposed. Everything we fought for in Colorado down to the last half hour of the legislative session, they gave us at the negotiating table. Not irrationally, not idealistically. It wasn't a change of heart. It's because they feared that we were able to potentially execute our collective bargaining proposal, enact that. And unions are more very logical. Um, they're concerned most about their dues and their membership. And then next up, collective bargaining, and pensions are somewhere right around there. And then teacher effectiveness reform, you know, issues, tenure, layoffs, compensation, that's tertiary for them. So if you show the capability to actually enact, enact collective bargaining reforms, they're logically going to give on everything short of that to pull back the barricades. And so this was the strategy led by the IEA. And I should note, the Illinois Education Association, which is the downstate union, which is the better resourced union with more members, is, has a history of pragmatism. And, and they led on this negotiation. They really kind of brought the other unions along. Joe Anderson, the former head of uh, the Illinois Education Association, now works with Ernie Duncan in the Department of Ed. And his son, Josh, is the head of Teacher America in Chicago. And the new director, Audrey Soglin, is very pragmatic. Um, I, I, I doubt this tape will ever get to her. Um, but uh, I would say that I'm interested in talking at some point about whether or not she, at the end of the day, would, um, was happy to get these issues resolved. I don't think she liked defending a seniority-based system. So in the intervening, um, that intervening time, Rahm Emanuel is elected mayor on the first ballot, and he strongly supports our proposal. Jim talked about the talking point that we made up and he repeated a thousand times probably on the campaign trail about Houston kids going to school four years more than... Uh, Chicago kids. That was another shoe that dropped. And it really um, put a lot of pressure on the unions, particularly the Chicago Teachers Union, because they didn't support them. So here's what ends up happening at the end of the day. April 12th, we're down to the last topic of collective bargaining. It's been saved for last. It's the hardest topic. We fully expected that we would, our collaborative problem solving of three months would end. And we would have an impasse and, and go to war. And we were prepared. We had m money raised for radio ads, and, and our lobbyists were ready. Well, to our surprise, and with Rahm Emanuel's involvement behind the scenes, 
we were able to split the IEA from the, the Chicago Teachers Union. And in January, just after we hadn't gotten our proposal through in the, in the lame duck session, I'd worked with a labor lawyer named Jim Franzik, who's absolutely brilliant, um, if any of you know him, and his partner um, of counsel, Stephanie Donovan, on fallbacks. And Jim and the other supporters had approved fallbacks from our initial proposal, essentially isolating Chicago and calling for binding arbitration or um, fact-finding proposal, fact-finding process that wasn't binding but would have a high threshold for unions to approve. We came with a fallback of binding arbitration when we saw that the Illinois Education Association was willing to do a deal and just focus on Chicago. They, interestingly, pressured the Chicago Teachers Union to take the deal. Karen Lewis, the head of the Chicago Teachers Union, who's a diehard militant, was focused on maintaining her sense of her members' right to strike. Her sense was that binding arbitration was um, giving away the right to strike. But our next proposal, our next best, which was a very high threshold, four strikes, for whatever reason, tactical miscalculation on her part, was palatable. Rom pushed it. Kimberly Lightford pushed it. We'd done our homework. We knew that the highest threshold of any bargaining unit that had voted one way or the other on a collective bargaining um, agreement on a contract vote was 48.3%. The threshold that we were arguing for was three quarters. So in effect, they wouldn't have the ability to strike, even though the right was maintained. And so at the end, in the end game, the Chicago Teachers Union took that deal, misunderstanding, probably not knowing the statistics about voting history. And the length of day and year was no longer bargainable in Chicago. And we insisted that we decide all the fine print about the process. She was happy to let us do that. With the unions then on board, they were relieved, the IEA and the IFT were relieved to have a deal. They came out strongly in support of this agreement, which was this wholesale you know, transformational change. And with that support, there was no reason for any politician to oppose it. So the Senate backed it 59 to 0. And then the Chicago Teachers Union leader started getting pushback from her, um, her membership for a deal that really probably wasn't, from their perspective, strategic. She backed off for a little while, but she'd already the die had been cast. She'd publicly been supportive. So we did some face-saving technical fixes um, in a separate bill, but the House approved 112 to 1. And a liberal Democratic governor who was elected by public sector unions, that's not even a debatable fact, signed it and took credit for it. So we talk about you know, a, a process that ends up um, achieving transformational change. It's going to allow the, next, the new mayor and the new CEO to lengthen the day and year as much as they want. The unions cannot strike in Chicago. They will never be able to muster the 75% threshold necessary to strike. And the whole framework for discussing impact, you know, what compensation is necessary, is set up through the fine print that we approved to ensure that the fact-finding recommendations, which are non-binding, will favor what we would consider to be common sense. So that's what happened. And um, you know, um, we're really happy to open this, but we're, we're talking about an opportunity now for transformational change across Illinois in that principals will have the power to dismiss ineffective teachers that they'll be able to hire who they want, that they'll no longer be forced to accept teachers they don't want in their buildings, and that when layoffs happen, they'll be able to let people go based on performance, not just seniority. And then in Chicago, they'll be able to lengthen their day and year, which has been just a horrible in inequity um, for decades. Uh, and all this with the narrative of union leadership. Because it was a fait accompli, and the unions decided smartly that they would pursue a win-win. We gave them the space to win. We've been happy to dole out plenty of credit. And now, it makes it hard for folks leading unions in other states to say this is, these types of reforms are terrible. Because their colleagues in Illinois just said these are great. So our hope and our expectation is to use this as a catalyst to very quickly make change, similar changes in other very entrenched states. That's the overview of what happened.